So we've looked at the bronchial tree as being the macroscopic conducting airways, taking air into the smaller airways and into the actual lung tissue. What we want to look at now is the actual lung tissue itself. Now after 20 to 25 divisions, the rings of cartilage are going to be lost and the airways contain some smooth muscle in their walls. And at this level, because now we're at a virtually microscopic level, in fact this would be a fairly microscopic structure, this is now called a bronchiole. So the larger bronchial passages break down following this fractile distribution into bronchioles. And the bronchioles will divide, we could call that one a terminal bronchiole, <clears throat> and they will divide into smaller bronchial passages, even smaller, but these very small bronchial passages have got blebs in their walls, fairly thin blebs in their walls like this. And these are individual alveoli. One of these will be an alveolus. And what these are doing is these alveoli are increasing the surface area of these small bronchial passages. So if this was a terminal bronchiole, these would be respiratory bronchioles. And the reason that these are called respiratory bronchioles is this is the very first time since the air has been breathed into the mouth and nose that the lining of the structure is thin enough to allow gaseous exchange. So the terminal bronchiole is the last of the conducting airways. But even in this terminal bronchiole, the wall is too thick for the oxygen to diffuse through or for the carbon dioxide to be returned from the blood. So terminal bronchiole, respiratory bronchioles, first time it's thin enough to allow gaseous exchange. And the respiratory bronchioles end in clusters of these alveoli, forming big clusters of alveoli. And these are the air sacs. So the air sacs are composed of clusters of alveoli, forming air sacs. And I think you can see all these alveoli are going to give a very large internal surface area over which gaseous exchange can take place. And in fact, if you're young and healthy and you open up all of these alveoli in each lung, you will have 70 square meters of internal surface area in each lung. That's 140 square meters of internal surface area between your two healthy lungs. Clinical applications come to mind immediately. For example, in asthmatic attacks, there is inflammation of these small bronchioles and mucus is secreted to fill up the secretion. The secretions rather will fill up the lumen, meaning that the air can't get into the alveoli. And also there can be contraction of this bronchiole. Of this bronchiole. <clears throat> That's why we sometimes give bronchodilators to allow them to widen up again. Or you might think of pneumonia. In pneumonia, there is actual infection at the level of the alveoli in the lung tissue. Or you might think of emphysema, where there's damage to the walls of the alveoli. But today we're thinking about the normal activity. So air will come into, <coughs> down here, and into the alveoli, inflating them. So the alveoli will inflate during the process of breathing in, during the process of inspiration. 
Now the over alveoli themselves are actually quite elastic. Now because the alveoli are elastic, we can use a balloon as an analogy. It takes active muscular activity to blow it up, but then because it's elastic it will automatically deflate. They don't empty all the way of course, otherwise they would stick together. So the elastic tissue in the wall of the alveoli will cause it to contract down, they are elastic. But a bigger effect actually is the surface tension of the water inside which is causing the alveoli to close down. So what we actually end up with is air going into the alveoli in the process of breathing in and then of course the air goes out of the alveoli again during the process of expiration. So we've got air going in and out of the alveoli all the time, refreshing the air in the air sacs. And we've said that the wall of the alveoli are very thin. They're thin walled structures. Now the air going in here is going to be relatively high in oxygen. about 20.84%, just under 21% oxygen in fresh air. And the carbon dioxide in fresh air is going to be relatively low. So fresh air is going to be high in oxygen, low in carbon dioxide, and that's going to be going in. But the air that we breathe out is going to be much lower in oxygen, maybe around about 16%, and much higher in carbon dioxide, maybe about 4% carbon dioxide. And this is because the oxygen is absorbed into the blood and the carbon dioxide is going to be excreted from the blood into the air in the alveoli. Now let's look at what's happening here. Let me just clean this diagram a little bit. Now, approaching an alveoli or an air sac, what we will have here is a branch of the pulmonary artery. And the branch of the pulmonary artery is carrying relatively deoxygenated blood. Typically the oxygen saturations in this are going to be about 75% if you're at rest. If you're exercising it can be lower than that. So relatively deoxygenated blood is being pumped from the right ventricle of the heart through the pulmonary arteries into a pulmonary arteriole. So a pulmonary arteriole is going to be approaching the alveoli. So in the alve, in the blood from the pulmonary arteriole, the oxygen is going to be relatively low. But because this blood has been around the body and is being pumped back to the lungs by the right side of the heart, the carbon dioxide is going to be relatively high. So blood is approaching low in oxygen, but high in carbon dioxide. Now what will happen next is this arteriole will break into numerous hundreds of capillaries. I'll just draw two capillaries there. So here we have two pulmonary capillaries illustrated. Two pulmonary capillaries. Now the blood from the pulmonary artery will go through these pulmonary capillaries and as you probably know there's going to be red blood cells going through these capillaries, these pulmonary capillaries. And eventually the pulmonary capillaries are going to drain into a pulmonary venule. This venule will join together with other pulmonary venules, eventually forming branches of the pulmonary vein to take blood back to the left atrium. 
So we have a situation now, if we consider the oxygen, where the oxygen in the alveoli is relatively high, but the oxygen in the blood is relatively low. This means there's a higher concentration of oxygen in the alveolar air than there is in the blood. As a result of this, oxygen will move down its diffusion gradient and go into the blood where the oxygen will mostly become associated with the haemoglobin molecules in the red cells. So oxygen will move down its diffusion gradient from the alveolar air into the blood in the pulmonary capillary. This means that the blood leaving in the pulmonary vein is going to be high in oxygen. High in oxygen. So the blood arrived low in oxygen. It's moved through the pulmonary capillaries. Oxygen is diffused down its diffusion gradient from the air in the alveoli into the blood, meaning the blood leaving in the pulmonary vein to return to the left side of the heart is going to be high in oxygen. And typically that might be 98% saturated. But if you take a few deep breaths, you can soon get that up to 100% saturation. Which is pretty impressive because if you take a few deep breaths, that means that your lungs could not be working more efficiently. You're getting 100% saturation of the blood passing through your lungs. Now, in the same way that the oxygen is going to be relatively low in the blood approaching in the pulmonary arterial, the carbon dioxide, as we've noted, is relatively high. So we have relatively high concentrations of carbon dioxide in the blood entering the pulmonary capillaries. But because the air in the alveoli has been refreshed by atmospheric air, and the atmospheric air is very low in carbon dioxide, that means we have the situation now where the levels of carbon dioxide in the blood are going to be higher than the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the air in the alveoli. That means the concentration gradient will be that the carbon dioxide will diffuse down its concentration gradient from the blood where the concentrations are high into the alveoli where it is relatively low. So the oxygen is diffusing from the air into the blood, the carbon dioxide from the blood into the air. That means that the blood leaving via the pulmonary vein here to go back to the left side of the heart is going to be low in CO2. And this explains why the inhaled air is high in oxygen but low in carbon dioxide compared to the exhaled air, which is lower in oxygen, but higher in carbon dioxide. The reason the exhaled air is, higher in is lower in oxygen is because the oxygen is diffused from the air into the blood. Therefore, the exhaled air is lower in oxygen than the inhaled air. The reason that the exhaled air is higher in carbon dioxide than the inhaled air is because air, the carbon dioxide, has gone from the blood into the air in the alveoli to be breathed out. So remember, air in, high in oxygen, low in carbon dioxide. Air out, lower in oxygen, higher in carbon dioxide. Coming down to the vasculature, in the pulmonary artery, the oxygen is going to be low, but the carbon dioxide relatively high. In the alveoli, the oxygen goes from the air to the blood, the carbon dioxide from the blood to the air, down their diffusion gradients. That is the process of gaseous exchange. The oxygen and the carbon dioxide 
of exchanging between the blood and the alveolal air, meaning that we get what we want, and that is that the blood in the pulmonary veins going back to the left side of the heart is highly oxygenated, low in carbon dioxide, ready for the left side of the heart to pump it into the systemic circulation where that oxygen can be used by the body tissues.